So we've just reviewed a whole bunch of properties of the Z-transform. Let's actually go ahead and work a specific problem where we use Z-transform properties to work out the Z-transform of a discrete time signal. So the problem we're going to work here is the following. We're going to work with the discrete time signal x of k, which consists of two pieces. This first part is k times minus one-half to the k u of k, and that is actually convolved with the second part, which is one-fourth to the k u of minus k. So this is the discrete time signal, and we would like to find x of z, the z transform of this signal, and along with it, the region of convergence. So I'm going to think about this as part one. I'm going to think about this as part two. And then this I'll think about as part three. We know that convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the z domain. So we can piece parts one and two together by multiplication in the z domain. So first, let's take a look at part one. <clears throat> From the table, if I had just the signal minus one half to the k u of k, this would be just a table lookup. I could go and look this up or even just know it from memory because we've done this enough times now. This would have a z transform of z over z plus one half with region of convergence magnitude of z greater than one half because this is a right-sided signal. However, this isn't the exact signal that I have in part one. In part one, I actually have a k sitting right here, so I don't exactly have this signal. However, I have a z-transform property that can help me figure this out very easily. There's a property that says multiplying in the time domain in k is equivalent to multiplying by negative z times the derivative of x of z in the z domain. So the differencing property, if I applied that here, says that I need to take a negative z times the derivative of my starting z-transform quantity. So by using the differencing property, we can directly compute this z-transform by doing this simple multiplying by z, the derivative of my starting x of z. So now all we need to do is take the derivative of this quantity. Well, that's not too bad, taking the derivative with respect to z. Also note, when we apply this property, the... Uh, Region of convergence doesn't change. We don't have to worry about that. So let's go ahead and work out what this quantity is. A minus z times the derivative of z over z plus one half. So that will be equal to a negative z times the derivative of the numerator with respect to z is one. So it's one times the denominator, which is z plus a half, minus what's on top times the derivative of the denominator with respect to z, which is one. All of that divided by z plus one half squared. So this is just the quotient rule from calculus. And I can go ahead and simplify this a little bit. I have z minus z on the numerator. So this simplifies into just one half in the numerator. And then one half times a negative z is a negative z over two. And my denominator stays the same. So I've been able to figure out what term one is in the z domain. Let's go ahead and Note the region of convergence. The region of convergence hasn't changed. The region of convergence isn't changed due to multiplication in time by k. All right, what about part two? In part two, I'm tempted to use a table again. If I had one-fourth to the k u of k, this would just be a table lookup. z divided by z minus one-fourth. And the region of convergence here would be z greater than one-fourth. However, that's not the signal I have in part two. In part two, I'm actually dealing with a time-reversed version of this signal. And the time-reverse theorem says, if you're going to time-reverse, you need to replace z with one over z in the z domain. Also, the region of convergence kind of inverts. The region of convergence is going to invert. So we need to worry about that here when applying the time-reversal property. So the signal that I do have in part two is one-fourth to the minus k, u of minus k. I can compute the z-transform of this quantity by using this time reversal theorem. It says I just need to replace all the z's in my original x of z. So here's a z right here, and there's also a z right here, by one over z. So that's what I've done. On the numerator, I've replaced z by one over z. And then on the denominator, I'm also going to replace that z by one over z, and then minus one-fourth. In terms of the region of convergence, originally I had magnitude of z greater than one-fourth. Now I'm going to have one over magnitude of z greater than a fourth, which if I multiply both sides by four magnitude z, I end up with magnitude of z being less than four. So the region of convergence is completely changed because I've flipped the signal in the time domain. So the region of convergence has to change. 
So just do a little simplification. This actually simplifies if you want to multiply things out to minus 4 over z minus 4. What about part 3? Part 3, remember, is the convolution property. There's these two signals, these two parts were convolved together in time, and we know what convolution is in the frequency domain or z domain. Convolution turns into multiplication. So that's the last part of the puzzle that I need. I can go ahead and piece all these things together. X of z is the z transform of part 1 times, because the convolution property here is the third part, the convolution, I'm sorry, the z transform of part 2. And the region of convergence, we have to piece these together. From part 2, we had magnitude of z less than 1 fourth. From part 1, we had magnitude of z greater than 1 half, so the combined intersection of those two regions is magnitude of z bigger than a half and less than 4. So this is one example of how you can use z transform properties to simplify computing the z transform of a signal. It often involves looking up something in a table that's very close to what you have and then applying some z transform property to get the z transform of the exact signal that you're dealing with.